Hey guys, just wanted to shoot a quick intro video here and thank everybody who watched the first couple videos of this training series and hopefully you've gotten some good stuff out of it. Um, again, really what we're trying to do here is just teach people all the advantages of having landscape lighting in their yard and, and the cool things you can do with it and how you can you know, totally transform the look of your yard and your patios and different areas on your property so that you can create those amazing outdoor living spaces and, and areas that you can entertain your friends with and, and have a glass of wine until all hours of the night. Um, and what we want to do is give you all the tools and the confidence so that you guys feel comfortable going and doing that on your own so that you can save thousands of dollars and not have to hire a contractor like me and my team to come in and design that system and install it for you. When, um, you know, if you've watched any of these videos, you can see it's very doable once you've gone and, and chosen and selected uh, what kind of lights and how you're going to do it. And uh, we're going to have a really big surprise in the next video where we're going to make that step um, a whole lot easier for you. So I uh, just want to recap on the last couple videos real quickly. Some of the things we've gone over is some of the advantages of uh, low voltage landscape lighting, um, you know, especially the difference between LED and, and halogen fixtures and how it increases the durability and the life of your system, as well as the cost savings to run that system over time. Uh, so we've talked about that, some of the, the different effects and the cool things that you can do in your yard when you're creating those great outdoor living spaces, um, some of the different things you want to light up and feature. So we've talked a little bit about that as well as we've gone into a real step-by-step -step guide of exactly how to go and, and install landscape lighting. And I know some of those videos were a little crude, but hopefully um, it still get the message across how simple and easy it can be to install your own uh, professional landscape lighting when you have all the right tools already in place and again in the next video um, we're going to give you a really big surprise that i think is going to make that super super easy where we've done a lot of the legwork for you so be sure to watch the next video i'm going to get right into it in this video and show you guys a little bit more some real life examples of what landscape lighting can look like and what are some of the things that you can do in your yard and i'm just going to get right into it again um, we appreciate all your comments and and questions that we've gotten over the last week or so please keep those coming in and, and hopefully we can keep answering those like we have been uh, and hopefully you enjoy this video and we'll see you in the next video again with that um, what I feel is gonna be a big surprise really help you take it to the next next step and so in the next couple minutes I'm gonna go through some some examples and show you guys really what landscape lighting can do for you and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the most popular lighting fixtures and how to use them most effectively. Uh, show you some examples of what you can do with lighting and what you can do with different types of fixtures, as well as leave you with some last minute kind of helpful hints and tips that we've used over the years that have really kind of helped separate us. And hopefully we'll do the same for you so that you can really elevate the level of the landscape lighting that you do in your yard to create that, that great outdoor living space. So. The first fixture that I'm going to talk about, which is easily the most popular one, is the most talked about one, is the one you see the most often, is uh, these uplighting fixtures. So where these are used uh, extensively is to light up trees, um, primarily is what you see people use them for. I'm going to show you some different ideas and some different examples that you can use these lights for. So what we try and do is retrofit our uplights with a really good quality drop-in LED bulb. The reason we do that is we can buy fixtures that are integrated with LED already built in, but by dropping in the bulbs, it gives us a little bit more flexibility as well as it lowers our cost of those lights. And that's something that we can pass on to our customers. Um, one thing that a lot of people get nervous about with LED lights is that they think that it's the that bright white color. Uh, when it's not the case, if you look at any bulb now, it usually has a color temperature on it. 2700 Kelvin up to 3000 is that warm yellow light that you're used to seeing from a halogen. So if you're looking for a bulb, that's kind of the color you want to stick to. Uh, the next thing to consider is the angle of the bulb. So how wide does that beam spread? You can get it down to like 10 degrees, which is just a very narrow beam, which means it's only going to, it's only going to light a very small area. I always prefer to use a larger beam spread because I want to light as much as possible with as few lights as possible. So I always look for a 36 to 60 degree bulb. And then just to give you a little bit of a comparison, when you're comparing an LED versus a halogen bulb, the other thing to look for is the wattage. Um, a four and a half watt LED bulb 
is the equivalent of about a 20 watt halogen bulb which is probably your most common and most standard uplight that you're going to find anywhere and then a five and a half watt bulb is the equivalent of about a 35 watt halogen bulb so now where you can use these i mean obviously they look good in, in any landscape but the more you can try and hide the actual fixture because we're not trying to show off the fixture even though some of them look really nice we're really trying to just get the effect so it's always best to try and hide them you know behind rocks or shrubs so that you don't see where the light's coming from but you get the effect from it so i mean here's just a couple examples of how they've kind of done that in the foliage and then here's an example of you know a patio that's been lit up by i would say primarily by up lighting there's some path lighting here but i think what people sometimes forget is that by putting an up light on a tree that's around a patio you get a lot of reflection off that foliage that sometimes gives you a lot more light than if you were to surround your patio with a bunch of garden lights like this so i mean i love the concept of trying to up light features around it and getting the light to bounce off because typically you can get more light with having to add a lot less fixtures again another example here is where they've just kind of used it on some different shrubs and stuff they have in the back they didn't have to light up the whole backyard um, but they've selected some some key shrubs that they've used the up lighting for there as well as they've used it you know like you see most people where they just light the trunk of a tree and get that light up into the canopy but again getting that light up into the canopy you can get a lot of light to reflect down off of that into your yard so i mean a really good a really good technique really good strategy for using less lights is use the foliage to get some reflection and and light up the yard another really cool example i mean this one has some path lighting in some of the shrub areas but i also like what they've done in the back here with some of the up lighting uh, along these cedar trees again it's not every five feet they've spread it out to kind of create a cool effect but it's just another example of where you can use these i like this one on a patio like this where you have some trees that are kind of overhanging it's really cool if you can light that tree up and get that light into the canopy that's over top of where you're sitting because it almost creates like a moonlight effect or, or you get some reflection down on you and it's a really easy way to light up a big area if you have some trees like this so i really like this technique in this example again in a garden or a shrub bed a lot of times people will just fill these with different path and garden lights i like the idea of putting in up lights even on some smaller trees and some smaller shrubs because again you get that reflection off of the leaves and the foliage that will help light up that garden area anyway so you can use a lot less fixtures by using a technique like this plus you can't see the fixture which i always think is pretty cool when you can just see the light just see the effect but people can't see the fixture where that's coming from uh, you know, not the greatest picture, but another example of use of up lights. I mean, obviously, they've got a mix of path lights and up lights in this one, but I really like using up lights along houses, and especially ones that have a textured, um, whether it's rock work or, or some kind of texture where you kind of get that shadowing uh, off the different textures. So, I mean, that's a really cool idea. I think it's very underutilized. Not enough people do that. Um, whether you have a million dollar home or not i think it's a really cool technique and i mean obviously using it to light up your trees again along a, a driveway you can still light up that driveway without using path lights but just getting that reflection off the foliage i mean i, I think is so so key uh, another example of how they've used them you know in a couple different areas again up lighting some trees over here uh, but then up lighting the front of the house and it doesn't have to be real extensive rock work even a lot of times on stucco if you kind of hide it behind the plants um, it can create a really cool effect and really highlight your home this is where i talked earlier in earlier videos about curb appeal i mean you go to a house a house that's lit up like this you can't help but notice it and it have it stand out a little bit more so i mean it's a really easy way to make your house stand out a little bit more and give it that extra curb appeal uh, this is a really cool shot uh, another way that I like to use up lighting is to create these shadowing effects that you see over here along the house really all it is is just an up light but it's just positioned a little differently instead of having it right up against the house you know lighting up this whole area they've just placed it back a little bit behind this tree and now it shines through and it creates a shadow on the house which I think is a really cool look 
uh, if you have that kind of stuff, if you have some trees or some shrubs that you can kind of utilize and create some shadowing. Again, just another real cool example of different shadowing you can do with lights. Uh, this pertains more to downlighting, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but a really cool, a really cool look that I like to use. And just another example of how they've used it, you know, again, under under trees to uplight the trunks and the foliage, but then along the house as well, just to kind of make the house pop out and stand out a bit. There's a little bit of path lighting along with this one. And one thing I want to point out is you see how, you know, I go to a lot of houses where it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, they've got 10, 12 solar lights just lining the driveway. And we're not trying to land a plane. We're just trying to create some cool effects and provide a little bit of light. And you see how here they've got basically two, two, three path lights that light up this whole area because we don't need to light up the whole thing. We just need to give people a sense of what's there. So, uh, you know, just some really cool examples of uplighting. The other type of light that I'd say is probably the most utilized, but I think could be used a lot less, but still has its place in just path and garden lighting. Basically a light that shines the light down and disperses it in kind of a circle area. Again, what we do is we like to use a, a really good quality fixture with a really good quality drop-in bulb. Again, it just keeps our costs down and is something I would highly recommend to get good quality, but still keep the prices down. Uh, one of the most important things when looking at path and garden lighting is the actual stem and the height. I have found over different trials that the wattage of the bulb and how much light that puts out is a, sometimes a lot less important than the actual height that that light is sitting at. Uh, for example, I mean a 12 inch high light is going to disperse a smaller lighting um, area than an 18 inch or 24 inch. I usually recommend an 18 inch is a really, really good height to cover 90% of what you're trying to do. 24 inches is good if you're trying to you know, um, you have high gardens and you want to light up a bigger area, the higher the stem, I find, obviously, the more light that it's going to disperse. Uh, just an example of path lighting, again, that's used in a garden. As you can see in this one, there's not a million path lights. There's one or two that do a really good job of lighting up uh, lighting up this garden area. And then again, just using up lighting to catch that foliage and get that reflection down to help light up the rest is a really good way. You know, another example of a path light in a garden here to light up some, you know, some nice stonework that they have. I like path lighting for that. If you have low lying stone or, or some nice rocks in your garden, it's a cool way to kind of highlight and feature those. Again, uh, you know, an example of lighting up a pathway. But, you know, I talked about this before. It's not, it's not a light every five feet. Right, they've got one, two, again, three path lights that light up this whole area because it's not about it's not about throwing a bunch of lights in. It's you want to light as much as possible with as few lights as possible, and with a good quality light at the right height, you can light up a big size area and not have to buy a whole bunch of lights. So something to consider. Again, just another example of a different kind of path light in a garden. Um, and it, here's uh, you know how they light up some some pathways uh, again you know kind of pointed on this and some other ones but it's not uh, lining the pathway all down one side I like how they stagger it I think is a really cool way and it, for whatever reason it just seems like when you do that it it makes the light shine farther or it seems to light up a bigger area by doing that so I mean I always recommend trying to do that try and keep as much as possible your lights in some kind of mulch or or garden area the reason for that is just so that you don't have to go and weed trim around them and I mean it takes a lot of extra time to do that so just something to consider I like using path lights in areas like this where you have nice big rocks that maybe they're not quite high enough or it's not big enough to accent with an up light but using a path light to shine down on it I love using this technique and use it all the time because I think if you have those big rocks and features in your home it's a really cool thing that you can light up uh, an example again of you know just how they lit up some stairways and it, again it's just it's not a bunch of lights it's just a few lights dispersed properly to at least create a little bit of light so people can see where they're going and it looks good and trust me it always looks better the fewer lights you use than going over the top so something to keep in mind 
Another popular light is a wash light. Um, all I'm going to say about this is very similar to an up light. The difference is it's often used to showcase the front of homes and stuff. Uh, the reason being it's got a frosted lens that creates less of a hot spot. So it's just a softer light and it usually has a lot wider beam spread. So you can light up a much larger area with one light. These do cost more to do that, but a really good light that we use a fair bit too. Um, but your path your, and your garden light and your up light are definitely the two most popular. So some examples of how they've used it kind of in the back here to light up the front of the house. Um, again, stonework in larger areas like that, instead of having to put a whole bunch of lights, you can get away with one that'll cover a wider, a wider spread area. Uh, well lighting, really all this is, is this is lights that'll go right in the ground. They're built to live in the ground. So they're really good quality, really durable. Um, they cost, you know, quite a bit more because they do have to stay in the ground. And the area that you would use these, I mean, if you have to light up a tree and you don't have a mulch area or anything around it that you can hide the light, just bury it right in the grass. You can still mow over it. Um, you know, some maintenance, just make sure you keep leaves and stuff out, but that's primarily where you would use a light like this. Uh, down lighting, probably the most underutilized lighting that is out there. Um, most people will buy path and garden lights and up lighting, which are great, but down lighting, I think you can easily create some of the coolest effects. Um, my favorite one is a moonlighting effect. So the idea of throwing it up in a tree rather than at the base, but up in a tree shining down, uh, looks very cool. We did one project where a lady had a patio that she would sit out all the time on, but it was in a very, very dark area. And so she tried using Christmas lights and fairy lights and patio and string lights, which all looked really cool, but it didn't look natural. Um, and what we did is she had a really nice, tall, big poplar that kind of overhung over this patio. So we put two down lights up in that tree and we filtered them with a blue lens that um, kind of mimics more of moonlight and had it shine down. Uh, and she absolutely fell in love with it. It basically created an effect that it looked like she had a f the brightest full moon every single night when she sat on her patio. So it's, I think is probably the most underutilized light. The reason people don't use it as much is a little bit more work to install it, but you can create some of the coolest effects with this. And I'll show you some examples here. I mean, here's an example of they've used a fair bit up in these trees to light the walkway. I mean, a cool way of doing that, instead of having a whole bunch of path lights lined up, they just put them up in the tree and, and have them shining down, which I think creates a pretty cool effect. Again, some up in the trees, they create some cool shadowing effects. Um, I've showed you this picture before, but with up lighting, you can create cool things like this where those big shadows on the ground. Uh, and this is a great example of the moonlighting. Uh, you know, you put a blue filter on a uh, a light like this and it's going to look like you got a really really bright full moon in your yard so i love down lighting um, and i would recommend as much as possible to do it often and you can do down lighting and still buy a simple up light and just mount it up in a tree so it doesn't have to cost more to do it it's just a little bit more work to mount it that's all uh, again another really cool example of how they've used it to create that moonlighting effect um, hardscape lighting, I mean, there's all kinds of different hardscape lighting, deck lights and that kind of stuff. I'm not going to talk about a lot of them. The one that I like the most that I see people use the most is just this, um, kind of this cap lighting that people will use in stonework. Uh, we use it a lot on fences. It looks really cool there too, but it just kind of hides under the brickwork. So you don't see the light. You just see the effect that it creates. So it's a really cool way of lighting up some different stone features and rock walls. Again, we use it a lot on fences and that. I don't have any pictures here, but it's a cool way to do that as well. Uh, underwater lights, these are lights that they typically cost a little more, but you can actually you can actually put these right in the water and they're built to last underneath the water. The one thing I would say about these is spend the money on these because if they're cheap, there's probably a reason and they're not gonna last. An underwater light with some kind of warranty is always best. And just some of the cool things you can do if you have a pond area, and it doesn't have to be a big giant pond or waterfall, it can even just be a small, small little water feature you have on your property it can look really cool with some underwater lighting. So there's some examples of that. These are elaborate and over the top, but again, small ponds still looks great. And then lastly, I just want to show you some pictures comparing what it looks like during the daytime and what landscape lighting looks like when it's done properly at night. 
Here's two examples of a project we did up here in Calgary. Beautiful home, beautifully landscaped, great walkways and trees and features to highlight. And basically, I'm just showing you the difference between night and day. And why not, if you're going to spend this kind of money on landscaping or any money on landscaping, why not be able to enjoy it day and night, not just in the daytime? Again, another example of how we've kind of highlighted the front of the house, some walkways, how we've done that. Um, just, again, comparing the difference between night and day. And then lastly, I want to show you the difference between a good quality light, what you find at the store uh, in a low voltage landscape light, and then what most people buy is some type of uh, solar light. So, you know, here's an example of a solar light that we bought, um, you know, and they do, they do a better job than they used to. But they're only going to light up so much. And the biggest thing with these is I would say it's the quality. The quality is just not there. They're not going to last. You've probably bought some solar lights before that you've got to replace them every year. They just, they're not built to last yet. The technology is just not quite there. Uh, you know, this is a box store, low voltage light. It's obviously much better. Again, the quality is not going to be nearly the same, but it does do a better job of lighting. And then when you go and get a real professional, well-built fixture, this is, I mean, that's the difference. It's, you can see, right? Again, this is a professional, you know, really good quality uplight versus a solar light. I mean, there's a huge, huge difference. So yes, it costs more, but you get so, so much more when you go and do it properly. Uh, and lastly, you know, just the difference I get asked all the time. I mean, solar lighting has its place, but there's a definite, definite difference. What we've done here is these are, Solar lights compared to good quality low voltage lights placed in the exact same spots in both pictures. And I mean, you can obviously see the difference between what a good light will get you and what, you know, I would say fairly expensive solar lights will get you. There's there's just a huge, huge difference. So I just want to leave you on a few with a few last helpful tins, hints that we've learned over the years. I mean, like I've talked about, try and use as few lights as possible to light up as much as possible. You're not trying to land a plane. You don't have to line your driveways with path lights. Use some of the techniques that we showed you with the moonlighting, uplighting the foliage and getting the reflection off that is a great way to use less lights, save you money, and in the end, I think, pre create a better looking product anyway. Um, you can accomplish some really cool effects and I think more and cooler effects with uplighting and downlighting than you can by using a whole bunch of path lights. I see path lights all the time, and that's why I wanna teach people how to use uplighting and downlighting a lot more effectively because I think there's so many more cool things you can do with that. Yeah, I just showed you some pictures, but I'm gonna tell you, don't waste your money on solar lighting. Yes, it's easy to install, but you get what you pay for. Um, the technology just isn't there yet. It's getting better, and I've seen better solar lights, but the quality is not the same. And it's just the technology is not, not that it's not out there, but it's not being sold in stores yet. Or I haven't come across any kind of solar lighting yet that comes anywhere close to what you can do with some low voltage wired lighting. Uh, another cool tip, and I talked a little bit about this. It's a little bit more technical, but I mean, ask us some questions about it because you use it all the time is you can use filters on your light. So if you go buy a light, like I talked about earlier, a frosted lens is a great way if you're lighting a house to minimize the hot spot and, and make that light a little bit softer and disperse that light a little bit. Um, green filters on lights we use all the time when we're trying to light up, say, an evergreen tree or any kind of really green foliage that you want to pop, you put a green filter on there and it makes it look like the healthiest plant you've ever seen. Uh, and then, like I talked about with moonlighting, the blue filters is a great way to kind of create that more natural moonlighting effect if you're using downlighting. Uh, blue filters also work really well uh, in the wintertime. A lot of customers we have will actually go change out the filters in their lights just for the winter to blue because it just, for whatever reason, it just stands out that much more in the snow. You know, obviously I'm from Canada here, so we don't have... 12 months a year of green. So we got to do some stuff in the winter time too that makes it look pretty cool. Um, quickly, color, you know, I talked about that a little bit. If you're buying LED bulbs or LED lights and you want to compare to what it would look like with against a halogen light, your 2700 to 3000 Kelvin temperature is what they call it, would be the equivalent to that warm yellow light that you would get on a halogen light. And then also talked about this, but beam spread. I always try and get 
the maximum beam spread that I can buy from a light. Reason being, I can light up more area with fewer lights that way. Again, you pay a little bit more for those bulbs, but in the long run, the cost comes down and I think it looks better that way anyway. And then lastly is just if you're comparing wattages and different bulbs, a four and a half watt you know, uplighting MR16 bulb is going to be the equivalent to a 20 watt halogen bulb, which is kind of your standard that you'll find out there. And five and a half watts is equivalent to a 35 watt halogen. So that's kind of the end of this video. What you're going to get in the next video, I'm really excited about. We're going to give you a really big surprise. I know I talked about different kinds of lights and, and all that kind of stuff, but we're going to launch something that's going to make it super easy for you to decipher between all the products out there and help save you a bunch of money using the same techniques and strategies that we've used over the years so watch the next video because i think you guys are really going to enjoy this kind of extra bonus and the surprise that we're throwing in and again leave us your comments and questions below we went through a lot of stuff i want to know what you guys want to see on your property so please leave us those comments thanks for watching um, and yeah, stay tuned. The next video is going to come up real quick here in the next couple of days, but we're going to kind of show you that big surprise. So check out our YouTube channel as well. If you're looking for any more how to videos and we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks so much for watching.